the Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Tom Arthur up to 10 minutes, Minister. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to update Parliament on the provisional outcome against the budget for financial year 2021-22. The provisional outcome demonstrates once again that this government has prudently and competently managed Scotland's finances. This again has been another exceptionally challenging year. The Scottish Government has had to respond quickly and decisively to significant challenges, in particular the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the cost of living crisis and the tragic illegal war in Ukraine. However, our effective and prudent financial management has meant every penny received by the Scottish Government has been channelled to where it was needed the most. In 2021-22, we spent over £5.7 billion in relation to COVID. This includes just over £2.6 billion of supporting health and wider public, health and wider public health initiatives and around £1.5 billion in business support and self-isolation grants. Part of this business support was a £375 million package announced to support firms impacted by the unexpected spread of Omicron. This was proportionately significantly more than the Chancellor announced for the UK as a whole. We continue to roll out a highly successful COVID-19 vaccination programme, including those vital third booster doses to combat the unexpected Omicron variant. We spent over £3.5 billion on social security benefits, including £57 million as we started the game-changing Scottish Child Payment. And we also committed an additional £4 million of Scottish Government humanitarian aid as the first part of a contribution to support of the Ukraine crisis, supporting those inside Ukraine affected by the conflict and for vulnerable people who were displaced from Ukraine whilst they were in transit. Looking forward, the Scottish Government remains committed in ensuring that, as a country, we continue to effectively manage the ongoing recovery from COVID and provide stability and support against the impact of the cost of living crisis. Responding to the pandemic, sharply rising inflation and the cost of living crisis has once again put a spotlight on the challenges we face in managing such volatility within the narrow restricted fiscal powers we have. We face the same interrelated challenges as other governments across the world, but we do so currently without the tools and levers other governments have at their disposal. The current fiscal framework is inadequate and leaves us with an imbalance between the risks to which the Scottish, uh, Scottish budget is exposed to and the levers that we have to manage those risks. Presiding officer, we have uncertainty over our UK government funding. The UK government did not confirm our final funding envelope until six weeks before the end of the financial year, materially changing it, with no prior warning right up to that point. This limits our ability to do long-term optimal planning and makes efficient and effective deployment of late funding changes extremely challenging. This is an important point and links directly to the management of the budget and spending well. The total resource funding confirmed so late in the year was over £1.1 billion. Some of this was expected, but large elements were not. We want to make the most of that funding, and doing so requires managing programmes of spending across the cut-off that is our year-end. This is not underspending. It is maximising the effective use of our budget. There is a challenge of managing this volatility in our funding envelope, and it is compounded by a funding model which means carry forward of our budget between financial years is tightly restricted. Our priorities need to be managed using a multi-year model. These challenges, unfortunately, do not stop at the end of a financial year. We also have to manage within strict limits on how much and for what purposes the Scottish Government can borrow leading us to be overly dependent on UK government policy. This has been compounded by the UK government's decision to remove necessary COVID consequential funding at a time when we undeniably need to continue to provide additional support to our public services. And this is why, until such a time as the people of Scotland choose a different constitutional path, we will also continue to make the case to the UK Government for more proportionate financial powers to help manage pressures and volatility in Scotland's financial position and allow the Scottish Government to respond fully to its priorities. The forthcoming fiscal framework review 
must take place in that context. A narrow technical review of the framework will not deliver what the people of Scotland need or want. Turning now to the 2021-22 provisional outcome, under the current devolution settlement, the Scottish Government is not permitted to overspend its budget. At the same time, the carry forward of budget between financial years is very limited, meaning that phasing of expenditure between financial years is extremely restricted. The UK Government does not constrain its economy and businesses to manage their finances through one single year, so why do they expect a devolved nation to do this? This is the situation we currently face in Scotland. There is therefore a balance to be struck to ensure we maintain spend within our budget limits but do, but do not generate high carry forwards between financial years that would risk breaching our reserve cap and result in loss of funding. We have, however, once again managed to maintain this balance under these strict fiscal constraints. I can report that the provisional fiscal outturn for 2021-22 is £47 billion against a total fiscal budget of £47.6 billion. The remaining budget of £650 million, which represents just over 1% of our total budget, has been carried forward in full through the Scotland Reserve. It is made up of £421 million of fiscal resource, £183 million capital and £46 million of financial transactions, which, of course, can only be used for loans or equity investments in entities outside of the public sector. It is important to note that there is no loss of spending power to the Scottish Government as a result of this carry forward. As I have said, Every penny has been allocated in full, allowing us to implement measures at the most optimal time, rather than being constrained to a single financial year. This is evidenced by the fact that the majority of this carry forward has already been proactively anticipated in the 2022-23 spending plans that have been approved by this Parliament, including £324 million anticipated within the 2022-23 budget published on 9 December 2021, and the £120 million announced on the 27th of January of this year by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy to support local government costs at stage one of the budget bill process. £265 million of this funding is directly linked to late UK government consequentials, finally confirmed only six weeks before the end of the financial year. The remainder represents just 0.4% of our budget and is already built into our 2022-23 plans, funding expenditure in 2022-23, with the full budget allocations being disclosed to Parliament as part of our autumn budget revision process. I highlight that these outturn figures for 2021-22 remain provisional, as they are subject to the ongoing audit process. Finalised figures will be reported as usual in the annual Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts and a statement of total outturn for the financial year 2021-22 later this year. To conclude, the provisional outturn demonstrates that the Scottish Government has maintained a firm grip on Scotland's public finances in the context of a year with significant challenges. We have delivered on our priorities, maintained the balance of not breaching our fixed budgetary limits and ensure we have sufficient ba balances to fund our 2022-23 spending commitments. This is despite the challenges and fiscal restrictions the UK Government places upon us. And I commend today's figures to Parliament. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business, and I'd be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for prior sight? And there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that this remains a very challenging fiscal environment in which many factors are combining to make the path to recovery uncertain. Now, it's perfectly true, as the Minister said, that the Scottish Government cannot overspend on its budget. But what the whole of Scotland wants to know is why ministers have not acted upon the demands that they themselves have repeatedly made to ensure that both businesses and public receive financial support as quickly as possible. Because that's exactly what the Cabinet Secretary demanded of the UK Government just a few weeks ago. Yet today we learn that there's a large underspend of £650 million. And yesterday we learned that the Scottish Government has still not decided, a month on, what to do with the £41 million received in Barnet consequentials from the Household Support Fund. So can I ask the Minister two questions? 
Why, when we have businesses who are collectively struggling with debt, with a recruitment crisis and rising costs, and many families really struggling with the cost of living, is the SNP not releasing more money now so that it can deal with the current financial constraints? And secondly, will the Minister confirm to Parliament that the Cabinet Secretary will make a statement prior to recess to announce how the Scottish Government will spend the 41 million Barnet Consequentials to help low-income families, which she has been sitting on for a month. Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, I trust that the Member has received the provisional outturn briefing note for MSPs, and I am sure she will have familiarised herself with the annex to that, which details all of our spending on COVID in the last financial year, including in business support. In business support, over the course of the pandemic, we spent £4.7 billion. That is £500 million more than we received in consequentials from the UK Government. And as I stated in my statement, all of the money within the reserve will be disclosed to Parliament through the autumn budget revision process, which is a formal process for parliamentary approval. And Ministers, as always, will appear before the committee as part of that process and be subject to scrutiny. And as with regards to future parliamentary business, that, of course, is a matter for the Bureau to determine. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. And can I too thank the Minister for early sight of his statement. Uh, indeed, uh, both, um, uh, both uh, COVID and the cost of living crisis necessitate the government gets the money it has out the door as quickly as possible. And of course, uh, the Minister cited £5.7 billion of COVID spend. That's £100 million less than was received in consequentials that year. And indeed, the total consequentials due to COVID was £14.4 billion over the last two financial years. So can the Minister confirm how much of that £14.4 billion has been spent cumulatively over the two financial years? And how much of it, given the issues raised by uh, Audit Scotland, remain in reserves, not just of the Scottish Government, but in local authorities, uh, NDPBs, health boards and IJBs. Uh, can I also just ask the Minister for clarification? £650 million is very close to the threshold permitted by the Government to hold in the Scottish Reserve. And given that these numbers are provisional, is there any risk that that threshold will be breached? Minister. Can I thank Mr Johnson for these questions. On his last point, in terms of our management, there is that headroom of £50 million. But he raises a very important point, which is the fact that these reserve limits are now out of date. They are not indexed. They do not increase as with inflation in the Scottish Scotland's budget. So that is a key issue that will have to be addressed as part of the fiscal framework review. As regards to the total uh, the money within the reserve, um, I will be happy uh, to confirm to the member in writing, but there is no carry forward um, from any COVID funding into the reserve. The money that was spent in the last financial year has been detailed in the annex. There are similar publications available detailing COVID, fund, uh, COVID funding that has taken place in previous years. That information is available, and I am happy to write to the member to direct him to it. That would be helpful. I call John Mason to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. I yeah, thank the Minister for his statement, which I thought was very clear, and yet we still had the words large underspend being used by Liz Smith, somewhat misleading for the public, I would suggest. Can the Minister confirm that the Government has to underspend because it is not allowed to overspend? Minister. Yes, um, and the Member makes a really important point. This is the fundamental reality, and it would be reality faced by any, any party in government, we cannot overspend our budget. And if I was standing here reporting that we had spent above and uh, breached our cap, I am sure I would be rightly being criticised by opposition politicians. But I think the important thing to look at as well is also the context, because it's when you look at the actual underspend, from the, if you look at the money that was not anticipated, not 0.4%, now, I would just draw members' attention to the fact that in the devolved administrations, our devolved administrations where we have outturn figures for 2020-21, the Northern and Irish Government had an underspend to budget of 1.1%, and the Welsh Government had an underspend to budget of 0.5%. In England, where we have an underspend for this year, the figure was 6%. I call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Uh, th thank you, President Officer. The SNP Government recently claimed in their spending review that tackling climate change was one of their key priorities yeah. for the rest of the parliamentary term. However, it has now emerged that in the past year there was a £511 million underspend by the SNP Government in this portfolio area. How on earth can the SNP Government claim to be tackling climate change 
when they aren't using all the financial resources at their disposal? Minister. This government is absolutely committed to tackling climate change, which is why we have introduced world-leading targets. The reality is that many of these projects have been impacted by a combination of the pandemic, of supply chain issues and workforce. So if we take a look at if, we, if, we want, if the member would care for our government itemised breakdown of some of the challenges. So the one hundred and twenty three million pounds in resource, part of this is ultimately a reflection across the NZ pro, uh, portfolio of improved passenger revenue in respect of rail. There was underspend in Northern Isle ferries due to lower cost of fuel and capital was underspend, significant underspend in energy. And that is ultimately a reflection of the fact that all capital delivery programmes are demand demand led and have been severely hampered by continuing effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in financial transactions, a majority of the underspend there within the NZ portfolio is in energy, where loan income was higher than anticipated. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Paul Sweeney. As the Minister has outlined, the pandemic caused considerable uncertainty in terms of budgeting, with the need to respond quickly to rapidly changing circumstances. And he's mentioned the additional uncertainty caused by late notice or indeed lack of engagement from the UK government in terms of when funding could be expected. And I note that despite this uncertainty in its recent report on Scotland's financial response to COVID-19 audit, Scotland has concluded the Scottish Government managed its overall budget well. That said, can the Minister advise what lessons can be taken from the experience of public spending during this crisis, and can he advise what changes could be made to better manage such uncertainty? Minister. Uh, enough, the pandemic has brought into sharp focus the existing deficiencies in the fiscal framework. Unlike other countries across the world, we cannot respond quickly to emerging needs by borrowing, and this leaves us overly dependent on decisions taken by the UK government. And I think we can all remember specific moments during the pandemic where that posed very severe challenges. Because being reliant on consequentials with little clarity and certainty over their scale and timing makes response and recovery planning extremely difficult. The current fiscal powers are also being eroded by inflation over time. As I touched on, key borrowing powers and reserve limits within the fiscal framework are currently set in nominal cash values and hence are not protected in real terms from a growing tax base. And as I said earlier, Presiding Officer, the fiscal framework review must consider the challenges faced um, by these fixed nominal limits on the current borrowing and reserve powers, as their real-time effectiveness continues to deteriorate over time. Paul Sweeney, to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister knows only too full well the scale of the cost of living crisis and the misery that millions of people are living through at the moment. And the reality is that people need that underspend money in their pockets, not sitting in a Scottish Government reserve being saved for a rainy day. So can the Minister tell us why he believes it is appropriate or indeed fiscally prudent for the Scottish Government to recently announce the potential loss of up to 30,000 public sector jobs during this cost of living crisis while sitting on an excessive £420 million resource underspend? That is money that could be used right now to alleviate hardship faced by millions of households across Scotland. Minister. It is money that is going to be used. It was anticipated in the budget last December, and the full uh, process for disclosing how that money will be allocated to current and ongoing commitments will take part, as it always takes part during the budget process at the budget revisions. That is just normally how things operate in this Parliament, and that is what we will continue to do. And I want to work collaboratively and constructively on the cost of living crisis, and I think we saw a great example of that yesterday afternoon in the debate we had where we, fought, we saw a great amongst parties across the chamber, not one party, but against mo with most parties on taking measures to go and help people. But the reality is that every penny within the reserve is, is, is committed to spending in this financial year, and that's exactly what we will do, and we will disclose that as we always do through the budget revision process. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Well, thank you very much, President. Also, I'd like to thank the Minister for, uh, for the statement and also the clarity regarding the substantial sums allocated to business support during the pandemic. Uh, and it's so clearly very vital that effective systems actually were in place uh, to detect and prevent fraud, uh, which is certainly very much in comparison to the situation down uh, with the UK Government, which the Public Accounts Committee there found that billions of pounds of taxpayers' money will be lost to fraud and error as a result of the UK Government's approach. Can the Minister, however, provide any further information about what assessment has been made of the effectiveness of systems which the Scottish Government put in place to detect and prevent fraud within its business support scheme? 
Minister. Uh, presiding officer, the risk of fraud was mitigated through a number of control mechanisms built into the design and delivery of the business support schemes, including the decision to ask local authorities to administer many of the grants based on non-domestic rates and their existing administrative capabilities, including fraud detection and prevention. This meant local authorities could use a well-established, robust existing data set and other information relevant to determining eligibility to enable a large number of businesses to be paid quickly with appropriate checks in place to mitigate fraud. In late 2021, the Scottish Government undertook a retrospective fraud risk review on 11 major business support funds administered by local authorities and other bodies. This concluded there was a reasonable assurance against fraud risk for business support and appropriate controls were in place. This work is reflected in our unqualified consolidated 2020-21 accounts opinion. The Auditor General recognised the fraud estimate was reasonable and acknowledged actions which had been taken by the Scottish Government to minimise fraud risk. It is the responsibility of delivery partners to recover payments that have been made fraudulently. The Scottish Government's initial work looking at assurance uh, for fraud risk found comprehensive fraud prevention measures in place within local authorities, together with the experience of managing fraud risk in areas such as local taxation and the application of exemptions. There were high numbers of rejected applications within the largest schemes delivered by local authorities, which indicates proper scrutiny at a point of application. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. With the crisis in our NHS and social care, the cost of living crisis, and businesses struggling to pay the bills, particularly in the aftermath of COVID, every pound needs to be put to work and fast. And I echo the words of Liz Smith when she says that, that the government cannot afford to sit on this money. We need to get it out the door as quickly as possible. It is important that the Scottish Government properly account for how the COVID funding was used. And we've heard something in the last answer about uh, fraud detection but lots of money will have been lost to fraud or be in, indeed mistakenly distributed by the government. So can the Minister provide further analysis to the Parliament uh, and an update on how much the government has lost to fraud or error, the steps being taken to reclaim the money and how many people the government has working on it at this time? Minister. Well, as I made reference to in my response to Mr McMillan, um, we utilised delivery partners and recovery will be the responsibility of delivery partners. Um, I can say that based on available data on a number of factors, we believe that undetected fraud on, a, on an estimated level of fraud was around 1 to 2 per cent of overall spend. However, the available data tells us that of the fraud detected, a loss of around £600,000 was realised as of April 2021. The total spend for the largest local authority to deliver schemes at that time was £1.6 billion. Our estimate of 1 to 2 per cent would have put fraud at £16 million and £32 million, respectively. We are currently working with delivery partners and Audit Scotland to improve our estimates based on an improved understanding and management of fraud risks, improve consistency and quality in the capture of data on fraud and error, and increase post-delivery testing of control effectiveness. The output of this work will form part of the Scottish Government's 2021-22 consolidated accounts. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK lost £12 billion to furlough fraud alone, I understand. The need for a fiscal framework review has been reinforced through the pandemic and now the cost of living crisis. This has clearly demonstrated how difficult it is for Scottish ministers to act without sufficient fiscal powers and often with late notice or lack of engagement regarding Barnet consequentials. Can the Minister provide an update as to the Scottish Government's latest engagement with UK counterparts regarding the fiscal framework review and the changes it hopes to see as a result of this review? Minister. President Officer, we are clear that the review should be broad in scope and it should look at not only the operation of the framework to date, but also the balance of risks and whether further levers are required to grow Scotland's tax base and support economic recovery. The review must ensure the Scottish Government and Parliament has the necessary powers to manage the risk we face within our devolved responsibilities and to support economic recovery. I understand that the Joint Exchequer Committee will be meeting later this month and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance will discuss further arrangements for the review, for the review with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. I call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for his statement. The pandemic and cost of living crisis have had and continue to have extremely harsh impacts on the Scottish public sector and on our economy more generally. These crises show the need for reflexive fiscal powers to deal with the shocks that affect Scotland 
in a unique way. Does the minister agree that the outturn statement illustrates the increasing extent to which the fiscal framework and devolution settlement more generally fails to meet Scotland's needs? And can he say how independence would ensure that Scotland has all the fiscal levers and flexibilities it needs to invest in its own vision of a green recovery? Minister. Well, the, there's a really important point um, within that question. Firstly, we do have the upcoming fiscal framework review, as I refer to um, in my response to Mr Gibson, and I won't repeat what I stated there, but it's clear we do need movement. There was, when the fiscal framework was agreed, it was recognised that there should be a review, and with that in itself was an admission and an understanding that this would be a process and an event. And I think there are a number of areas, regardless of what our constitutional views are across this chamber, that we should be able to unite upon. For example, expanding borrowing powers, expanding um, flexibilities around the reserve, making sure that limits and caps move um, with inflation. These are simple, straightforward measures, but there are further things we could do as well to enhance the powers of this Parliament through the fiscal framework review, full powers over income tax, devolution of the, full devolution of national insurance, devolution of VAT. But the member is absolutely correct to say that the best option for Scotland and the option that the people of Scotland are going to be presented with in the near future is that of becoming an independent country. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Co-Cab Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We understand these figures are provisional. But it is crucial, Minister, that getting the detail when it comes to social justice, housing and local government. Yep. Therefore, can I ask the Minister to further comment on how the spending will be broken down, given the tight financial difficulties facing local government? Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, if the Member is asking specifically with regards to the outturn, with regards to local government, he will note that there is a £210 million overspend in resource. This was a reflection of money transferred uh, for a range of measures, such as business support and employability from the finance and economy portfolio. If it is with regard to the variance on capital spend, that is similarly the case with capital across the board. It is specifically focused within the affordable housing programme, and it is a reflection of the challenges around it, emanating from the pandemic, supply chain and workforce, which have impacted the construction sector. So I hope that provides the detail around that portfolio that the member is looking for. And Co-Cab Stewart. Thank you. Um, Brexit continues to have a substantial economic impact on the UK and Scotland. Uh, could the Minister provide any further information about the assessment which the Scottish Government has made of the impact of uh, Brexit on Scotland's economy? And can he say more about the steps which the Scottish Government is taking to mitigate the impact of Brexit on Scotland's public finances? Minister. No, presiding officer, we do know that it is six years to the day when Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain within the European Union. And I think that closer, we are closer to rejoining the European Union than we were to the day that we were forced to leave. We know that Brexit is contributing to the 19th consecutive monthly rise in prices charged by businesses in Scotland and causing UK food prices to increase by over 6 per cent, hitting the poorest families hardest and contributing to the cost of living crisis. According to the OECD, the UK will have the lowest growth in the G20, apart from sanctioned Russia. And the OBR forecasts that Brexit will hurt GDP growth by twice as much as the pandemic. Brexit has direct implications for public finances through lower working age population and GDP resulting in lower government revenues in the long run. Since 2019, Scotland's good exports fell by 20 per cent, largely driven by a decline in oil and gas exports, amounting to a fall in goods trade with the EU of 16 per cent, whereas trade with the EU non-EU countries dropped by only 4 per cent. But even as Scotland tries to cope with the fallout of a reckless hard Brexit, the UK government is irresponsibly risking a trade war with the EU over the Northern Ireland Protocol, and that once again reinforces the need why this Parliament and this country have to become independent. Thank you. That concludes the Ministerial Statement Provisional Outturn 2021-22. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item.